Williams visit is uh, directed by a lawsuit settlement back in 2005 under Governor Schwarzenegger, where he uh, agreed to have schools visited by the county superintendent staff across the state. So all 58 county superintendents sent staff out to schools to visit to make sure that the schools have instructional materials uh, in good supply for all their students, uh, that their buildings are in good condition, and that uh, their school attendance report cards meet all the criteria. And I'm here to report tonight, your district and your schools have met all the criteria with flying colors. I believe you have a report in your agenda that identifies uh, the uh, scoring. Your scores are ranged from a high of 98.25% at Marks here at Marks Elementary. Uh, Dos Bellas High School, 93.3% was a low scoring school. But of course, uh, that's typical across the county that the larger high schools, through the older buildings, have a bigger challenge ahead of them. Uh, the kinds of things our staff looks for because just like auditors, they're looking for something to report. Uh, they report things like cobwebs or lights out or stains and ceilings or stained carpet uh, because of rain and the concern about uh, staining and mold. So those are the kinds of things that were looked for and found. There weren't a lot of cases, but uh, quite frankly, uh, you had a very good report this year. And uh, I'm happy to tell you that uh, I won't have to do this type of report again next year. Uh, the next thing that we can move on, Chair, I've got good news for you, really good news, better than what I just shared. Item 7.2? Yep. The Virginia Smith Trust. First of all, is there any, are there any questions on the WIMS report from anybody? Okay, so we'll move on to 7.2, Virginia Smith Trust Project. The danger of having you start looking at something and reading it before I before I talk about it, I'm going to pass out a form in there enough for the audience to there. The Virginia Smith Trust um, is a trust that is governed by the Merced County Board of Trustees, the, the County Board of Education. And you may have heard about it in the past. Uh, Virginia Smith gave the county office 5,000 acres of land uh, back in 1971 to use for scholarship development. And it was on the east side of Merced. It was grazing land that was leased out to uh, dairy farmers for grazing. And it generated about $100,000 a year for about 35, 40 years. And that $100,000 a year was given to kids that lived in the county of Merced but went to Merced High School or Gold Valley or El Capitan. They had to go to high school in the city of Merced. Back in 1988, um, some folks in Merced came to the trustees and said, you know, that land would be a lot more valuable if you gave it to the UC regions to build UC Merced, to build a UC, because the regions were looking for that shift campus. And so that's what happened. Um, the, the trust gave their property to the regions of California in a land swap. Uh, the, the deal was, we're going to give you the land to build the UC and then you're going to give us what's whatever's left back and we're going to get to develop it and we're going to provide scholarships for everyone in Merced County, not just the children in Merced, because the land become much, much more valuable. So it's taken a long time to get here, but I'm happy to report that things are moving ahead. In 2017, when I took over as county superintendent, that just happened to coincide with the point at which UC had finished all their entitlements for the property that they were going to use. We had mitigated all of the fairy shrimp uh, environmental threats. Uh, and most of our acreage was actually consumed by uh, setting land aside in perpetuity for the fairy shrimp, the burrowing owl, the California king snake, the, the San Joaquin Valley kit fox, and a couple other endangered species. We got out of the 5,000 acres, 654 back. Now, the, there's good news and bad news. The good news is that, you know, the, uh, there's only, that, that land was worth $25 an acre when we inherited it in 1971. It's now worth about $200,000, or will be worth $200,000 an acre when it's fully entitled. Uh, of course, the bad news, it's only 654 out of the original gift that we gave you see. 
But uh, what we're doing now, what we're in the process of doing right now at the county office, and as I'm also the executive director of the trust, as executive director of the trust, we're moving forward with an entitlement project. That I'm telling you about it for two reasons tonight. Reason number one is your kids will benefit in five years. And your kids here at Doss Palestine will be able to apply for a Virginia Smith scholarship. Uh, that's our projection today. Uh, it may be sooner than that. I don't want to. I don't want to overpromise. That's the death of a politician, right? An elected official is overpromising. But we expect that uh, we'll be fully entitled by this time next year by the county of Merced. In another six months, in a year and a half, we'll be annexed to the city and we'll have sold our first 80 acres to a developer or a master developer. And we're expecting the price of that land to be about $200,000 an acre, uh, as long as there's a, not another crash. And it doesn't look like there's gonna be. Uh, and so we're gonna break that 650 acres up into uh, several parcels of 80 acres each. By the time it's all sold off, we'll have between 110 and $130 million in bank. And that's why when you look at this chart, you'll see uh, the projections over time expanding quite rapidly once you hit 2025. So right now, as of right now, there's a the picture of uh, the development. Uh, if you could go one more slide, one more slide. Okay, you can see there how it's gonna be broken out in spaces. And so uh, we're gonna do the phase, of phase one in the next, six to eight years in the last phase we think will be sold in one block because it will really be ready to go as a big block uh, at that point in time uh, there'll be enough energy around the development to just sell it all but what what our uh, experience has been in the last several years with our endowment fund when we did this land swap we also got two million dollars out of the packer foundation that we put in the bank and that's been growing right along that's how we've that's how we've given that $100,000 out each year. When you look at this chart, you'll see that we started increasing that amount um, when we planted this land in almonds a couple of years ago. The grower gave us $100,000 bonus before almonds were produced. Now that the almonds are producing, we're getting uh, a percentage of the crop. And that percentage of the crop this year looks like it's going to be worth between, uh, well, I don't want to conjecture, I'm not a farmer, we do know that the tonnage on the almonds that are still in their hull is something around 300,000 pounds. So uh, we're thinking maybe about $150,000 once they're shelled and off to market. We're going to add that to the $400,000 we've been giving away. And we'll be giving away at least $500,000 this year to the students from Merced. And what we're doing to try to get people's attention, because last year we tried to give away $400,000, we couldn't do it. We only had 35 applicants. We gave them $5,000 to $10,000. We gave away $235,000 to those 35 students. But uh, we're changing some of the criteria. Uh, and the board of the County Board of Trustees has already done this. For years, they only gave scholarships to kids that were juniors and seniors in college. That's great. You're, you're giving money to kids that are already successful and you're pretty sure that money's going to pay off. Unfortunately, that doesn't motivate kids to go to college that may not have the financial resources to get that start. And so we are moving the scholarships down to freshmen, college freshmen. So seniors in high school can apply and they'll have counselors that will be supporting them. And we're going to uh, borrow a, a model from LeGrand, uh, LeGrand High School. And their model is to give every kid that finishes their A through G requirements uh, through the fall semester of their senior year a bonus check, a grant of $200 to pay for either their college application fees or to pay for hopefully their um, down payment for their housing costs, their housing deposit later in the spring. So that isn't even going to be competitive. That's just, you've done it, here's your check. And we're hoping that motivates the students to apply for the scholarships. We think most of the scholarships are going to be around $2,000 this year, but that will grow, of course, as the money grows. And then we're, we're going to expand. We're going to have to go back to court, go back to probate court, and change the terms of the will to cover all children in Merced County. Now, you have to think back to when Virginia was a child. A little, little history lesson. Virginia is the <clears throat> granddaughter of an early settler in, in our county. He was a gold miner, but he wasn't very good at it. But he was really good 
at raising sheep for market and for wool for San Francisco for the clothing industry. And uh, so he had uh, developed a land legacy here, 15,000 acres in Merced County, 600 in Tuolumne County, another 5,000 down in San Luis County. And his children and grandchildren lived off what the first Cyril Smith did in the 1850s. The, uh, the kids, the, the grandkids, Virginia Smith and her brother Cyril Smith, neither married, and uh, they left all of their uh, inheritance that was still intact to the County Board of Education and Marquette University. So that's why we are here tonight to share with you this vision for your kids. Uh, and I'm gonna need you to be able to call Scott Silvera when this goes to the County Board of Supervisors for Entitlement this coming July. I need to have everybody in Merced County weigh in and tell our supervisors, this is the right thing to do, entitle this property. Uh, we're not any other developer. When we've talked to groups like LAFCO in the past, uh, they aren't really, if they're not from Merced, they don't know about the Virginia Smith Trust. And so we've got to educate people around what the trust will do. It looks like a developer. It acts like a developer, but it's not a developer. It's an educational trust that's going to benefit the children of the entire county. And so the phone calls to, to Scott are going to be necessary. And then I believe you have a resident from the Dos Palos area that sits on the LAFCO board. And his name is escaping me at this moment. Bob Pateo. Yes, that is exactly right. And he needs to know that LAFCO, who has, has the last call on this, on this property being annexed into the city of Merced, that needs to be a yes vote too because this development needs the sewer connection back to the city of Merced. And the best way to get that, the cheapest way to get that for the, the development is to have LAFCO annex us, approve the annexation back in the Merced, uh, the city of Merced. Uh, that act, the city of Merced actually took their first step Monday night on a pre-annexation agreement. So they're on board at the city of Merced. They're moving forward with their annexation of UC. And uh, it, it's moving forward now and it's gonna happen um, while this current class of freshmen are in school, by the time they're seniors, there's going to be money for them. Yes. Is there anyone we can call to expedite the amendment of the trust so you can get this money shared to more of the Merced right. County kids since you're having trouble giving it away to just the Merced schools? Is there anybody that we can help you call to expedite that? Uh, <laughs> well, we don't, we don't have a judge assigned yet, but the, the good news is the judge is in uh, Merced Court. It's not the San Francisco Court where the where the trust was originally adjudicated. Uh, so we brought it into Merced. So there will be a judge that I will know about eventually, and I will let your superintendent know who that is uh, because that that's going to be an important step too. We think that uh, we're going to make a case that we can't spend all this money in Merced. We have to go outside. And the promise in 1995 when the UC Regents chose Merced, it was because of this promise that we're going to give scholarships to the children of Merced County who are underrepresented in the UC system. Thank you. And I appreciate the time. It probably took more than you anticipated. Thank you very much. Thank you. Happy to answer any other questions. Uh, you can always reach me. Uh, and it's the reason I'm running again, because we've got to get this done. And uh, so looking forward to, to seeing this happen. Thanks very much for your time and support. Are there any questions before we go? No. There's one more MCB item on the list. I'm not going to stay for that. It's the MOU agreement to bring a special ed classroom in. I hope we have your support on that too. Thank you very much. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. 8.1 public hearing regarding trustee area map plans presented by Brian G. Martin of AALRR. Mr. Martin. Yes, good evening, Board President O'Banion, Board members, Superintendent Alba. Pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I am uh, Brian Martin. I'm an attorney out of the uh, Fresno office at Atkinson Anderson. I'm working with uh, David Saldani in our office and your consultant cooperative strategies um, to develop the, uh, the new trustee areas and the uh, trustee uh, area uh, voting um, regime that uh, you've been looking at in prior board meetings. 
So this tonight is the uh, is the second board meeting uh, to consider the uh, public hearing for the trustee area scenarios, particularly the, uh, the the maps that have been prepared by the demographer for their strategies. So I'm here to provide the information for this second public hearing. Um, the three maps that were presented uh, at the October meeting, um, they were uh, looked at, reviewed by uh, David Saldani and myself. Um, we suggested to the demographer that they do a little bit of fine tuning to scenarios two and three. And that's why you have before you tonight uh, revised um, scenarios two, two A, and revised scenario three, which is designated as three A. Um, so just quickly, that's the reason that we have uh, introduced those two somewhat tweaked um, scenarios that you can see the adjustments on the map itself. So um, that's kind of the main. Not only is this second public hearing required by law, but we also want to make sure that you're aware that we did a little bit of fine tuning population balancing in those uh, scenarios two and three. So uh, just going, I'm sorry, to go back to uh, slide number two, um, you probably had some discussion on this, yeah, the considerations of the trustee areas there. Um, I don't know if anybody has any questions, but these are the areas that are considered. These are the factors that are considered in the development of the trustee areas. Um, and you might have been uh, advised on these, but those first two bullet points with the check marks there are kind of the, the legally driven considerations that the demographer uh, reviews and looks at um, these, the state laws and the Federal Voting Rights Act laws all have certain aspects or elements that have to be observed in the development of the trustee areas. Uh, these other areas are also considerations that take into account more local considerations, uh, community input, board, board input, and those kinds of considerations are um, considered in those other uh, areas. Uh, the types, the, the configurations of the, of the uh, trustee areas are looked at under compact and contiguous um, communities of interest. That of course looks at neighborhood uh, uniqueness uh, and certain elements of particular areas that might want to maintain a cohesiveness in the new plan. Uh, Man-made and natural geographic features are also considered when drawing out these maps. Uh, respecting incumbency if possible, that's not a big driver, but that is a consideration of the demographer when drawing these, um, these maps. And then other local considerations such as school boundaries, locations of school sites and those kinds of things. So the, the, uh, the next uh, slide, you guys have uh, had this before you uh, previously, I believe this is just a breakdown of the, uh, the 2020 census data uh, by demographic uh, categories. And of course, these the percentages there on the far right column, just kind of give you a snapshot of the, uh, the, the demographic breakdown in the district. Uh, slide number four, again, that just provides some historical uh, data with, with regard to voting age population. Um, that's uh, from a database that gathers this information every five years, so it's a little bit more recent than, uh, well, we've got the, the 2020 uh, data, which of course is the most recent, but this uh, voting age population data is uh, gathered on a five-year um, rotating basis. Um, okay, so let's see. Um, slide number five. This gets into the scenarios. Scenario one, that's, there's no change. Scenario one from the last presentation, we think that one is uh, suitably balanced. Um, and just as a, as a notation, the demographer put in, as you can see, uh, stars there, uh, which is the general location of the board members' residence, just so to give everybody an idea of where that plays into each tr proposed trustee area. Or ask, ask question. Yes, I'm sorry. So if we're looking at map one. Yes. 
both trustees one and seven are in the same area. Is one supposed to be in the wall? Yeah, that's, I was just going to clarify that the demographer. Sorry about that. It's a little confusing. The uh, the demographer put in those trustee numbers there just to identify that that's a trustee. It doesn't correlate with the trustee area. From the we see the legend, the, the color coded legend there. Yellow is shows um, trusty area number one. Oh, I'm I'm sorry. Your question was yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. you're right. Yeah. Trusty one is showing in the light green yes. area. Yes. Area one. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Right. I was going off on a tangent there. Yeah, you're correct. Um, so that one has remained unchanged. Uh, the next slide just uh, again gives the uh, the detail of the statistics, the measurements, population uh, sizes in each uh, trustee area, and you can see that, that the top line there talking about that variance at the far right of the slide is 8.6 percent. Um, that's a very important number as you. Uh, probably recall from the pre previous presentations that that variance has to be uh, under 10% to make it uh, legal under state and federal law. So uh, that one, of course, meets the uh, variance requirement. Um, and then if we can go to uh, the revised scenario 2 to a which is slide number 12, I believe. Right. Yeah. Oh, there he is. Here's Watson. The original two with two A to revise, you can kind of see um, just the little adjustments that were made there. Um, but it's because of the colors, you can you can readily see how the uh, demographer made those changes. Um, again, that was just um, a some input that, that Mr. Saldani and myself gave to the demographer just to uh, uh, balance the populations in the, the various proposed uh, trustee areas. So that's the origin of that. And then same thing with regard to um, scenario 3A, revised 3 Again, that was just some uh, relatively minor adjustments just to fine tune the uh, pop population balance. Any questions on any of uh, uh, the original, the uh, scenario number one or the revised two or three? So the choices are going to be between one, two, three, or two A and three A. There's five of them, or well, is it going to be two A or three A, and not two and not three? Not two and not three. We we suggest uh, considering the board consider one, two A, and three. Why would we give them large maps of only two? So this we, is still we're still in the feedback. Yes. Yeah. So we're still in our feed. We're not in voting yet. So we're still feedback. So it's about right. going back and forth still. So if there's something you see in any of them that um, still want them to consider or redo or blend, then, then this is the opportunity to do so. Or you can call it later. Yeah, we've got, uh, looks like we've got a third public hearing scheduled on December 16th. So that gives the board that additional month or so to uh, get this in thought and uh, work with, with staff if necessary to call off our office if necessary. But um, yeah, that um, that information, whatever you need, just, just let us know if you need clarification on anything. Any I think it's the plan at um, at that December board meeting is to make a final decision. Is that kind of the goal for December 16th? Okay. And at that time, we, the board would be making a selection and we would have a, a resolution prepared um, describing the process, the board's decision, and the uh, election regime. Would no, be it would be January. January? January. Got it. Sorry. December would be our next period, and then January. 
Okay. Okay. So we're going to do a final public hearing in December, and then the board would make a formal selection and uh, adoption of the resolution that goes into essentially uh, in January. So there's a good amount of time to keep the whole oh, state doing any questions tonight? Or anything we can before. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you. Night. Thank you. Have a safe trip home. Thank you. Nine point one or reports fiscal cash status update presented by Melissa Kelpinski, Assistant Superintendent of Services. This is your home. Fiscal cash update Melissa Kelpinski is at a CBO conference. Uh, Melissa Kelpinski is at a CBO conference. Uh, Melissa Kelpinski is at a CBO Nine point two superintendent report, Mrs. Grahalder. students um, after cleanup data and we, we have dropped a little bit um, but we're still on on track with last year's enrollment um, landing at 2292 uh, we have our enrollment by school site or program there on the right um, covid district reports so we'll continue to um, send out our november detailed covid 19 our november our monthly updates and we in october was the first time we sent this out and we got some great feedback um, from our community partners and parents um, with it's just nice to know like what do I need to know what's new um, and, and positive information total confirmed cases um, 63 students as of the beginning of the school year 17 staff members uh, 
and total quarantined. At our Deep Hill Testing Center, um, thank you, Mr. Von Allman and, and his team. They've been doing a great job with our testing center. It's open Tuesdays and Thursdays uh, for our parents, Tuesdays all day and Thursdays from 2.30 to 4.30. We have tested 675, if my eyes are correct, tests um, um, or students or staff. Um, we are, that's a higher number than we anticipated, which is great because that means we, we knew how many staff member, we knew how many athletes, that means our parents are really, really utilizing this service. Um, we had a vaccine, our, we're continuing with our vaccine clinics. December will be our last vaccine clinic until probably March. Um, and we've had vaccinated 300 and I really maybe need to see it. 15, can you see the 35, 15 vaccinated um, in total. So that's community members or, or those uh, eligible. Um, attendance data. So we'll continue to, to keep up to date with our attendance percentage and chronic, ac chronic absenteeism percentage. Our goal for just to remind everybody for year, end of the year, year one is uh, attendance percentage, positive attendance percentage of 97% and chronic absenteeism below 15.4. Um, so as you can see, we are declining um, for our overall attendance percentage. Um, so we, we'll do some work on with that data. However, um, the good news is we've been putting a lot of efforts into our SART, making Mr. Valley and her team, SARB, um, sending officers and interventions to the homes. Our chronic absenteeism percentage has, to, has decreased, which we want that number to go down. Um, from 13.3% to 11%. So we'll continue to, as our students said, have missed 10% or more of the school year. Uh, suspension and expulsion data. So um, data each month. I've kind of played around with this graph. I think I like it a little better. Please let me know. August, um, five suspensions. We, we were up there in September with 16, but we're now have a declining trend of 11 and 10, and no expulsions for October, November. Um, on the right, we have a breakdown of altercations. Um, this is important to continue to track so we know where to um, target our interventions for SEL or social emotional learning, as well as um, our discipline interventions. Um, so altercations, we are still up at 33. So all of our principals are, are working really hard to create some action plans um, to decrease those numbers. Uh, we took our first um, fall local Benchmark it used to be orange when it starts dropping the color. It's in the fall benchmark. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Mendez, for putting this, this great chart together. Um, so, what you're seeing here is the bottom is our local first local benchmark assessment, ELA and math. Um, and then the top is our state assessment in ELA and math. So, this is the state average percentage. Um, it is apples to oranges because you're looking at um, local benchmark data, which was just, you know, from August to October, um, compared to um, the whole year from the state. Um, but when we're looking at it, um, we'll continue to compare each assessment um, individually, but then also as a whole. And then when we get to the end of the year, compare our local data state assessment to the state average. Um, so when you're looking at standards exceeded percentage, um, 6.8% was the percentage at the end of the year for the state, and for our first assessment, 7.4% um, in ELA, and then the math, 2.4% was exceeded percentage for the state, and we were at 10% for math. Um, and then standard met, and, and I don't have to read that, that's a three. So that, that's, we'll continue to use this, this information to target our interventions. What are we doing? So we've, um, and Mr. Mendez is going to give a, a more thorough report on our academic status and ed services in December. Um, however, uh, we our teams have been working extremely hard on the PR, our PLC template, embedding this into all district meetings. Um, what is a PLC template? So um, all of our meetings should not be, we think, we, we like. It should be, here's the data. This is the data that we're looking at. What does the data tell us? And what are we doing now? Um, so that's what... Um, our teams developed a, a template um, to use at these meetings, and it's now been embedded. Uh, so we're excited about that. Uh, our DPL dashboard is ready to push out to teachers. So we we're, we're, uh, have a professional development that you'll see on this agenda um, for winter time, and our teachers will be able to access their dashboard and then have professional development 
on how do we navigate that dashboard. We've been having collaboration meetings surrounding data and data-driven decisions. Um, and then targeted professional development um, um, towards the four our district goals and informing each one accordingly. Student activities. This one. Um, so student activities. So what's going on in each campus? Um, you see picture that you so upper left-hand corner is Marks Elementary. Um, so our grounds department painted this awesome, well, first the awesome um, breast cancer awareness ribbon, and the students got to stand around that, take a picture. They also did some writing assignments in their classrooms. Um, in the middle is our band at the Halloween parade. Um, I don't know if you guys had the opportunity to go out and see it, but it seemed like um, our community was out in full force. Everyone was smiling and really enjoying our students walking, walking the parade, the traditional parade that they were able to continue this year and our band got to lead it, so that's awesome. Right hand corner is a preschool student um, exploring with um, blocks and colors, and he was counting how many blocks it took to, to touch the ceiling. That would be happy to hear that, um, but he was definitely using his imagination. Um, bottom right hand corner, the Halloween parade at DPE, um, and our high school students being there to support our, our littles and the games and activities, and it was great to see the interaction again. And the bottom left hand corner was um, games uh, against our staff versus our students. Um, so they were interacting and building assets at Bryant Middle School. And then there was a GC picture there, which is I'm blaming it on PowerPoint, um, of the feast today. So they had, um, instead of eating outside or just eating at regular cafeteria tables, uh, George Christian staff um, set the tables and served, had this wonderful Thanksgiving lunch, um, and it was it was great to see them, them sitting, collaborating, talking, and um, I think there was even programs and flat center pieces, and so it was, oh. <coughs> this is why <laughs> So this is all the Veterans Day stuff that, that was great that happened. Um, in the left-hand corner of our grounds department, um, painted a flag here at Marks for our Veterans Day um, festivities and salute. And um, it's too dark, but it, they did a great job. The lines were like perfectly straight, so I, I was very impressed. And they just stayed extra hours to make sure on their own time without being paid um, to, to complete that. I'm um, in the very left hand corner. There was also a picture of the DPE students that were had their flags and they were marching or had the walkway for our veterans. Um, we also had our high school FFA in the right hand corner, as you see, um, the FFA, Dos uh, Palos High School FFA came to greet our veterans. And um, there was two other pictures. I should have a memory. Do you mind clicking on the link and let's hope that works? Not working. Can you copy and paste the link for me? So um, everyone got involved in the Veterans Day activities, including George Christian. So George Christian um, put together, journalism class put together a salute to our veterans. So they sent out a dialer and asked anyone who's interested to tell us about their veteran. Um, and then they put the video um, together in a link that's not working. Still not working? Okay. Go back to that page. Um, phase one of our cell tower is currently work is up and running and we have students with hotspots um, checking out hotspots and you'll see an MOU for in the agenda, um, the MOU for um, DSA approval for the tower at DPE. Our conference week and December 2nd is our Das Palace Christmas parade. We're hoping that our um, Everyone wants to be on a float and participate. And um, athletics is going to put a float together at the day. And we're hoping we'll have the same turnout as the Halloween parade. Questions? Thank you, Mrs. Bell. 9.3 report from board members. Ms. Austin. Mr. Moran. I saw them working hard on that flag. And I'll tell you what, I was excited. 
and I saw it going out. You know it's going up to one day I'm passing by doing work business and I'm seeing them out there painting the lines and I said they're getting creative, awesome. They're just definitely, you know, I saw them out there working, hustling and bustling. Did a great job. That, that, that was neat. It just set it off. Um, I have a couple things to report. First of all, I'd like to uh, give a huge thank you to uh, Mrs. Grijalva, Matt, um mrs Zalandis, rob calvert anybody else that was uh had any hand in helping uh our senior bronco football team that i have the pleasure of coaching unfortunately we didn't finish our perfect season like we wanted to we lost uh six nothing in the championship game in what i can ex uh explain as the fog bowl last saturday night six nothing um kids seem to be doing good but i want to thank especially irene and rob for giving us the tools to, I know uh, youth football is not affiliated with our school district, um, but they are our kids. And we we did a lot to help them. And, and it definitely paid off, Matt, um, having the facilities that we got to be able to use and prepare our kids on. Um, and they're learning that this week and a few of them get to go play in an all-star game. And they're, 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 they're realizing that not every youth program has has the availability of some of the facilities and the coaching and the support staff um, like we have. You know, Irene was there anytime I needed something. The soccer coaches, the cheerleaders that shared the practice field with uh, the stadium. Can't thank you guys enough. Um, it really, really pays off and that is a gym and it's something that it definitely helped us um, get to where we were and that, that should be commended. Um, other than that, just Thank you for everybody. This is Davis. It was so nice to see all those little kids and the staff for the veterans program and be able to be back to somewhat of a normal, even though we weren't like in here, but they were so cute. And actually the struggle they had with their hats in the wind that they're not used to was really entertaining. Um, it always helps to see the kids because it, it reminds you of Oh, that's why I do this because, you know, and that little greeting line you were talking about, they were so cute. And I was walking out and they're like, thank you for your service. And I'm like, finally, somebody recognizes my service. <laughs> I appreciate you little kids too. So they were totally cute. Um, Rhonda, you and your staff, you always go the extra mile to make sure that all of us are, are fed and special for the holiday. So thank you and your staff very much for all of that. I hope continued thanks to all of you for what you do every day. I hope you have some fun, get some rest and have a very happy Thanksgiving with your families. I have nothing. I was about to participate in the parenting and education course that was put on by the district. I wanna let everybody know we had a good time. My children enjoyed it. Child care was provided. Miss Rhonda, you always provide us with great meals. We looked, I got off work early to make sure I went there. So showed up hungry. There was always something good for us. My daughter enjoyed the classes. They break off little private sessions. Great. Parents had their sessions. We did awesome. Great incentives. I want to, anybody out there, encourage you guys to participate. We learned a lot, helped a lot, created that good family bond. We walked away with a lot of knowledge and nice little incentives for family time. So a great program. I want to put it out there. And the staff that was involved with it did an awesome job. Great so I want to make sure that we get props for that as well. Thank you. 10.1 Educator Effectiveness Block Grant Plan Draft Information Item. This is all of um, So this is the plan for the Educator Effectiveness Grant. Um, I'm trying to sync up. This is the draft, so this um, is just an informational item for everyone to read the, um, the EEBG plan, and then it'll be brought for approval um, for at the next board meeting. Thank you. Any, Any questions? questions on it? No. 10.2, first reading, September 2021, policy updates. Mrs. Grohal, the information item. So we have our policy updates um, for this, this next month. This is the first read. Um, for everyone to read through them if they have any questions, and then we'll move forward for adoption at the next meeting. And any questions? Thank you. 11.1 .1, public concerns will be heard by the board at this time. However, they will not be discussed. 
limit, uh, policy 9323 limits individuals presentation to three minutes. The president may extend the time under certain circumstances. This is the opportunity for members of the public to focus on issues important to the district's purpose of education. Under board policy, this time may not be present, may not be used to present derogatory information of a personal nature on any employee. Members of the public wish to address the board must speak from the podium and identify themselves. See none at this time. Adoption of routine consent items, 12.1. The consent counter represents routine items acted upon in one motion by a roll call vote. The recommendation is for adoption unless otherwise specified. Any item can be removed for discussion upon request. Donations, 12.2. Monetary donation to Bryant Middle School Hiking Club. 12.3. Monetary donation to Dos Paz High School FFA Agriculture. Minutes, 12.4. Board meeting minutes, 10-21-21. Regular board meeting and 10-25-21 special board meeting. Out of state overnight travel, 12.5 Dos Paz High School cheer competition at Roseville. 12.6 warrants and payroll. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mrs. Davis, seconded by Mr. Moraz. Are there any questions on any of these items? We'll call for the vote. And it passes. I don't know if I'm supposed to do this or not, but I want to do want to give a shout out to our cheerleaders that overnight trip. They were the grand champions, highest score out of everybody there, right? Yeah, congratulations, cheerleaders. Action items 13.1 discard outdated instructional instructional materials, textbooks at Dallas Paws High School. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mr. Bonds. Second. By Mr. Moraz. Are there any questions? Continuously looking at materials, what are, we, what are we using, what are we not, and then just carving those that are, are outdated. Call for the vote. It passes. 13.2 extra pay for extra hours, additional academic and safety supports. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mrs. Davis. Second. By Ms. Austin. This is Grijalva. Um, so our ESRA 3 plan was a, was approved board meeting ago, two board meetings ago. Um, so this is one of the action items is to provide extra additional time for professional development, for safety reasons, for pacing calendar, for instructional supports. Um, and so it's divided by school sites and principals will keep track of that time um, and ensure that it's it's used on those parameters. Any questions? Open vote. Passes. 13.3 professional development winter session, January 3rd through the 7th, 2022. Is there a motion? So moved. Uh, Mr. Moraz, seconded by Mrs. Davis. Mrs. Grijalva. So it's a week of professional development opportunities for our certificated staff. Um, this is the third week of winter break. Um, and there's targeted sessions towards our goals and aligning with the, our adopted district curriculum. Uh, and teachers can sign up for whole week or they can pick and choose um, a Monday, a Thursday, uh, whatever they see uh, would be beneficial to their instructional program. And uh, we'd like to offer per diem as part of the ESSER 3 funding. Are there any questions? Call for the vote. Passes. 13.4 professional development winter session trainer contracts. Is there a motion? So, so moved. moved. By Mrs. Davis, seconded by Mr. Bonds. Mrs. This is the contract for one of the professional development winter sessions um, for um, the science and literacy contract for the STEM scope. Any questions? Oh. It passes. 13.5 DSA inspection agreement for the DPE cell tower. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mr. Moraz. Second. 
Uh, Mr. Bonds, Ms. Grijalva. Uh, so this is a, the second phase, second tower that we're putting up to expand the services. Um, it'll be located on Dos Pels Elementary. We are using $9,200 of SR2 funds. So Bless COVID you. Funny. COVID funny, COVID money. Are there any questions? Call for the vote. Passes. 13.6 crisis prevention, intervention, training, certification. Is there a motion? So moved. So moved. By Mr. Mraz, seconded by Mrs. Davis. Mr. Um, so crisis prevention, intervention, training, also known as CPI. Um, training, instead of sending our staff to a training, we're going to do a trainer of trainer models. Our staff will get trained, and then they'll be able to train um, other staff members or pro provide professional development uh, on de-escalation skills, first classified and certificated. Any questions? Hopefully work. Pass. 13.7 MOU for Bryant Middle School project with MCOE. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mrs. Davis. Second. By Mr. Bonds. Mrs. Crowley. So this is the MOU for Bryant Middle School. It's a the special education project. And so I would like to put a um, two classrooms in the back of the uh, Bryant campus. Um, so this is the agreement of who pays what, who's, who cleans the building, who's, who, what kind of lease are we under, what happens if, if we don't agree, those types of parameters for that project. Is this the uh, back where they... So we're removing uh, what is now located, or what were our football, youth football room um, where is used, that'll be removed. Um, and then the building will go right on top of that. So one of the buildings will be where the football room is now, and then another right to the left of it. Um, it's also going to be replacing some cement and adding a parking lot um, to the back of our campus for our staff, um, and then also beneficial for athletic events. Where's the football room going? It's going to be that. So there's going to be two portables. So they're building two portables. One will be the football room, and then one will be the um, other building for the. Just curious. And this agreement, without reading the exact details on it, gives us the ability. Are there any other questions? To vote. <clears throat> it passes. Thirteen point eight resolution twenty one twenty two oh six emergency resolution for approval of award of contract for the emergency repair work for restroom at Marks Elementary School. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mrs. Davis, seconded by Mr. Moraz, Mrs. Grijalva. I was started a project at Marks Elementary with our restrooms, which was under the $60,000 bid limit. Um, and what we thought would just be a, not simple, in my eyes, a simple remodel, but math would probably differ. Um, but it started with just replacing. And uh, as we started digging into it, uh, we needed to replace the subfloor. And there was some, um, lots of gutting. That we have to do so because of that it went above the bid limit so this resolution um, will protect us from not going out to get the bids that we're use the restrooms right over here yes any other question call for the vote that passes 13.9, Marks and Das Plus Elementary, portable project. Is there a motion? So moved. So Mrs. Davis, so. And Mr. Moraz, Mrs. Um, so this is a portable project for Marks Elementary and DPE. This was the project that was um, approved a year and a half, two years ago now, um, that we're trying to move it forward with. Um, three of the portables will be installed at Marks and two will be installed at DPE. Um, it'll ink, we, desperate need room at Marks Elementary for student classrooms, um, and then same thing for future projects at DPE. So this is the recommended approval for the contractors. Is there any uh, 
questions or comments? Call for the vote. Passes. 13.10 annual organizational meeting for 2021-22. Is there a motion? So, so moved. By Mr. Moraz, seconded by Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Grijalva. So we need to admit before we get started, amend this. Um, instead of December 16th, 2021 at 7 p.m., we'd like to change that to 5.30. Absolutely. So is that motion? You still make the motion? Still you still motion. second the motion? Okay. <clears throat> Any questions? Call for the vote. Changing the, the meeting from a seven o'clock meeting. Correct? Correct. To 5.30. To 5.30. That passes. Personnel, employment recommendations, classified staff. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mrs. Davis, seconded by Mr. Bonds. Mrs. Grijalva. We're excited. We have five classified staff to join our team, one of which is here today. He was here today. He graced us with his presence at the beginning of the meeting. Um, but just want to welcome everybody um, to, the, to the DPL family who a couple have already been here, but uh, we appreciate you being on, on board and part of our team. Call for the vote. And it passes. 14.2 coaches, volunteer coaches. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mr. Mraz, seconded by Mrs. Davis. Mrs. Just joining, we have nine um, coaches that we recommend to work with our with our youth. Are there any questions? I thought Mrs. Westbrook was retiring. Um, um, put that on Zoom. Can't, uh -huh. can't handle it. <laughs> Call for the vote. And we thank her for that. <laughs> and it passed. 14.3 <laughs> FMLA. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mr. Bond, second by Mr. Mraz. This is Grijalva, standard. Yeah, standard. Call for the vote. It passes. 14.4, create and hire. Temporary paraprofessionals, is there a motion? So moved. By Mr. Bond, seconded by Mr. Mraz, Mrs. Grijalva. Um, part of our ESSER plan is to hire 12 paraprofessionals to have direct um, support in the classrooms uh, servicing our students. And uh, they are uh, spread out throughout the district. Any questions? Call for the vote. Passes. 14.5, create and hire two intervention counselors. Is there a motion? So, so moved. By Mr. Bond, seconded by Mrs. Davis, Mrs. Grijalva. Uh, we would like to add, uh, due to responding to COVID and um, the needs of our students, an intervention counselor out at George Christian and an intervention counselor at Dos Palos High School. Are there any questions? Call for the vote. And it passes. 14.6, create and hire one behavioral clinician. Is there a motion? So moved. By Mr. Mraz. Second. By Ms. Austin. Mrs. Grohl. Once again, responding to the data and the needs of students, we'd like to hire another behavior clinician due to student needs. Any questions? Call for vote. Passes. Written reports 15.1 Health Services. Priscilla Whitaker. 
15.2, maintenance and operations and transportation, Matthew McCullough. 15.3, preschool, Virginia Franco. 15.4, special education, Laura Delmas. 15.5, technology, Pajay Lee. 15.6, food services, Ronna Sullivan. 15.7, human resources, Jason Van Allman. Are there any questions about any of these reports? Thank you all. Future agenda items requested, 16.1, request from board members for future agenda items. Ms. Austin, <clears throat> Mr. Mraz. I have none. Mrs. Davis. No, sir. Mr. Bonds. Very good. Um, 17.1, uh, adjourn the meeting. Is there a motion? So moved by Mr. Mraz. Second. By Mrs. Davis. It has been moved to adjourn this meeting in memory of two um, long, long time coaches, teachers, mentors, uh, pillars of this community. Those two uh, gentlemen lost their lives in the last month. One was Jim Strickland, which was a teacher at Dos Palos High School for I have no idea how many years. He was my chemistry teacher. A lot of things that people didn't know about him. Not only is he a good man, but um, he, he did whatever he took to get kids, to help kids. He was actually my freshman football coach. People don't know he coached football. He was a track coach for a long, long time and just a downright good person. And we, uh, a lot of prayers for, with his family. And the second person, um, very big pill of our community, Alba Katrina. Uh, not only was he a school board member, multiple different sessions um, combined, the best estimate I got was over 35 years, um, be it the, the before it was uh, uh, joint and not. And that was up till I came on the board three years ago. Um, he was on this board. The other part of his life was is, uh, he gave over 35 years to coaching youth football, youth baseball. Um, I've heard a lot of stories from a lot of different uh, people that come back to the community that Albert Katrina taught me how to drive. He, 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 he fed countless youth in our community. Um, he gave them rides. He was a mentor. He was a father figure. Um, and just, just a downright good person, a uh, member of Dallas Paws White Service Club for a long time. Like I said, can't, can't, uh, can't say what enough of what both of these, these gentlemen meant to our community. We've lost a lot of good ones in the last, uh, in the last year, year and a half. So, uh, all those in favor of, uh, joining in the memory of Jim Strickland and, uh, Alba Katrina, signify by saying aye. 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 We're adjourned. He got here Greg's freshman year. No, my freshman year. Mr. Trick when I started high school together. He got here in 1983. Hey. Did you know Mr. Narvice passed away? Ray? Yeah. yeah. I forgot about him. Ray Narvice.